All right, and welcome back to the channel, everybody, and I hope you're doing fine. So the goal for today's video is that we create an epic wargaming table. Now, to be a little bit more precise, we're gonna do a modular gaming table. And you can use that for any tabletop game out there. Dungeons and Dragons, be it Warhammer, Age of Sigma, Warcry, doesn't really matter. In today's video, we're gonna start with the basics. So we're gonna start with very plain fields and also some river segments to spice up a little bit your gaming table. So we're gonna have some very basic elements, but you need a lot of them because, well, plain fields is something, yeah, you need a lot because if your gaming table is just full with terrain, then you can't really play on that one. And then we have a little bit more complexity with the river segments, but honestly, Creativity is the limit here. In future videos, we're gonna do some, I don't know, castle runes, you can do some swarms, you can do a tavern, whatever you can imagine. And if you wanna see that, well, cue the regular YouTuber begging for subscription and likes, because that's something that I wanna cover over the next months and years. And as always, there are timestamps in the description, so if you're only interested in very specific topics, then you can jump straight to those. Now the goal is to find, so let's get... I could just buy a gaming mat and be done with it. Good point, actually. So let's discuss this question for a bit. Why do I need a modular gaming table? And you know what? The question is fair. I, you can't just use a regular gaming mat, roll it out on a table, put some buildings on it and be done with it. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. You probably should even do that at the beginning when you're new to the hobby because everything else requires quite some time. Although I try to keep these videos uh, on a more simple level and also on a more budget level. I will always try to show you a budget version of everything that I do and then something a little bit more fancy if you wanna spend a few extra bucks. And now here comes my opinion why you should build your own gaming table. First of all, once you have all the modules, and I'm talking here about quite a few to be honest, you can always create a unique epic battlefield. And no battle will be the same, because at one point you will have rivers, at one point you're gonna have some forests, maybe some hills, ruins, we mentioned that already, I know. But if done right, you have a massive option of combinations to create the perfect battlefield. Second, nobody else is gonna have that. Only you. You're creating here something unique. Now, this might not be super appealing for everybody, but that's something that I like. If I create something, I want to be like, hey, this is unique. Only we have that and nobody else. Also, third, you can give the terrain heights and depths. Well, to be honest, though, you can always put something on a mat or a table as well and you have height. But with depth, it's a little bit more difficult. If you want to have rivers or maybe trenches, that will not work on a regular table because you kind of have to put the river on top of your gaming mat and that might look a little bit weird. It will work, I admit that, but it looks of course a little bit more epic if it's actually in the battlefield itself, in the modules and it's going through your war zone. Maybe you also want to build a pit uh, where you can, you know, toss sacrifices in there for dark gods. Who am I to judge? And now comes one more reason, and I think honestly it's the most important one, it's fun. Before we start now with the crafting though, I want to show you a few prototypes because I tried this already once and uh, I failed. So let's have a look at my lessons learned so far. Okay, let's have a look at this one, learning from failure. Um, um, I mean, prototypes. Okay, kind of weird to talk about failures. I like to call it more like prototypes. It sounds a little bit more positive and uh, maybe some lessons learned. So I did already a couple, so you can see these here. This is the basic concept, the basic idea of the whole thing, and uh, it's trash. So uh, there's a few things that I used here and I'm not super happy with them. First things first, I used one of these grass mats, cut them down uh, for the exact size that I needed, and it started to make waves with the glue. So maybe I used the wrong glue, maybe too much, I don't know actually. But uh, that didn't work out. Also, I'm not super happy with the surface of that thing because it's flat. Yeah, I know this sounds now a little bit weird, but you want a little bit of texture on your plate. Like not too much because you have mini standing on it and if it's going like wobbly, 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 
uh, they will trip and uh, they will not have the glorious death that they're looking for on the battlefield. And the XPS foam that I'm using here is okay, but also only XPS foam, you will drop these plates. You will use them a lot. And uh, if you don't have any sturdy support material, then you might be in trouble down the road in a couple of years because you do this once with these boring ones at least and then you want to be done with that. Also, I did some prototypes for River. So keep in mind, not a finished project, right? And it looks, it looks decent, let's put it that way, okay? So you could play with this, no issues. However, I stopped working on this piece here because Boy oh boy, do I hate resin sometimes. I have here some regular styrofoam and that does not work very well with resin. Although I thought I sealed everything here with uh, some plaster and some PVA glue, apparently it was not enough. And even though I sealed this here, it still leaked. And then you have this on your floor glued to it. So yeah, I learned a lot uh, the last time. Now, with that knowledge, Let's discuss a little bit the materials that we need. So the first thing that I have here is some wooden plates. So this is pine plywood, if I remember correctly. This is very cheap. I got this from Home Depot. Also, pro tip, let them cut this. The service costs absolutely nothing. So here is what I paid for all these module bases here. And honestly, is affordable so you have a little bit over I think one buck per tile I will give you the end calculation anyway so the pros of this is this will not bend because if you have this right here styrofoam and you have all this beautiful resin stuff will bend so you can see it already here not great right this right here will not bend, no matter what you do with it. Well, okay, there are probably exceptions, but you can put modeling compound on that, resin on that, and it should keep it form. Also, if you drop this, this will probably survive a little bit more. If you drop it on your foot, it might be a little bit painful though, so be careful. And then something else that I got is uh, XPS foam. So there's not much you have to be careful with when you buy this uh, XPS foam. They come in different colors. The colors actually don't matter but they can have different density. The more dense they are, the more sturdy they are. I know it's crazy, but they're also harder to work with. I like these ones right here. I'm gonna put a link in the description below. This is your regular isolation material that you get from Home Depot. Again, very cheap. I think I paid a little bit over 50 bucks for all of these. And I think I will get like, hmm, a lot of modules out of this one. And you probably saw it already, these XPS foam plates, they're way thicker than the ones that I use for my uh, prototypes. The reason for that is I want my rivers to be a little bit deeper. And if I want to have actual trenches, this gives me a little bit more room to work with. At the end, it doesn't really matter if it's like this or like this. Yeah. And uh, I prefer the, oh my God, the thicker variant. So I hope this will pay off in the end. Of course, this is a little bit more expensive, but as I said, I probably pay so far for the wood and the XPS from two bucks something for one module. So that is okay. The stuff that is probably the most expensive is this right here. So this is Battlefield Grass Green from the Army Painter that I, well, I think it's my favorite from all the grass types out there. Now, I know that you have grass that kind of, you know, you electrify it and then it's like standing. I don't like that for playing, to be honest. Like, you have big models that will be on these uh, tiles. Maybe you put some terrain on it. So if you have electrostatic grass, it will bend, it will break. Even after applying maybe a coat of glue and seal it, it will still break at one point. And then, then the electrostatic grass looks weird because some places will be bent and some will not. And maybe you see like the prints from the bases. For diorama stuff, yeah, that's great. But for a gaming table, not a big fan. So one thing you have to keep in mind is how big is your gaming table and what should be the size for one of these modules. 
Now, regular gaming table, I think is 60 by 44 inches. So what you can do is 10 by 11 inches and then you can cover the whole gaming table with perfect tiles. However, if you don't have perfect squares, you're limited how you can rotate them. And if you have these 10 by 11, for example, this is 10 by 11, it won't matter how you put them on the table. Now you can say, I don't care about this. Uh, if I lose 50% of my placement options. The thing is, if you later on have rivers and you can place them in two ways, yeah, I was not a fan of that, honestly. So what I decided to do is go with 11 by 11 plates. These right here. They're perfect squares, so no matter how I place them, it's gonna be fine. Now, of course, they will be a little bit bigger than at the end, than your regular gaming table, but you can just put some markers and, and be done with it. Another reason why I don't wanna be too, I don't wanna worry too much about the measures is they might change the gaming table sizes again. They did that already once, and uh, I think I go with the marker approach and just cut off the borders to have the perfect size for my battlefield than having plates that are super limited with placement just to be, you know, in sync with some rules that might get changed in a year or two because then you're sad after all this work. Okay, we talked about materials, lessons learned, we talked about measurement. So let's start with the first thing for today, day one. What we're gonna do is, first of all, we sent down these edges because, uh, yeah, the saw blade was not too gentle. We're gonna use this, sandpaper the edges. I'm gonna do this outside and not in my office because this will create a lot of dust. Then I'm gonna cut the XPS foam with my hot wire tool here for the perfect size. And then I'm gonna glue this XPS foam with PVA glue on my tile. That's it. Because the PVA glue takes a lot of time to dry. The water in the PVA glue vaporizes and that hardens the glue. That needs air though. So if you have the XPS foam glued on the wood, there's not a lot of air where, you know, the water and the glue can vaporize. So it takes a long time for this to harden. I don't like to use a hot glue gun because first of all, the hot glue gun can damage the XPS foam. And also it might, it might not be a hundred percent even at the end then because the glue is a little bit too thick on some edges and then the plates are, you know, a little bit wobbly on these tiles. And I don't want to do that. So I invest a little bit of time, let this dry until tomorrow. So let's go and do some actual crafting. All right, let's get started. Day one, sanding, cutting, gluing. As I said, I went outside and got lucky with the weather. I think everybody knows how to use sandpaper, so I will not show you how it took me almost an hour to sand all the edges on the plates. After doing one with just the sandpaper, I grabbed a wooden block that I use for exactly stuff like this. I wrapped the sandpaper around the block and it prevents the sandpaper from folding by accident or getting caught at the edges. Now let's start with a lesson learned. Buy smaller plates. There's just no way in hell you will be able to cut this properly. It's just too bulky and heavy. Gonna be honest with you guys, I struggled with this quite a bit. So I used my X-Acto knife and cut them in the middle. Keep in mind to keep two straight edges, because otherwise you have no border to guide the plates. I also needed to get a bit creative with the guidance system. There is normally a guide bar, but the 11 by 11 inch plates didn't fit. No biggie though, we just used the plates we already got from the hardware store and fixed them on the table. Easy. Afterwards I put the plates on the foam boards and marked with my knife where the hot wire had to cut. Having a shallow cut is pretty nice because it kinda grabs the wire and makes it easier to cut through the XPS foam. Now everything was set up for the actual cutting process. Let's see how we do. And perfect. The only thing you have to keep in mind is to do everything in one fluid motion. Whenever you stop, the wire will melt a dent into your plate. Not the end of your project, because once you line the plates up, you won't see the borders anyway. Once you're done with the cutting, you glue them on the wooden plates. There's one thing you should keep in mind though. Due to the nature of saw blades, some areas might be damaged because the wood splintered off. That's the side you want to glue on. Nobody needs to see that. 
All right, so we are done with that now. And honestly, I'm pretty happy with this. It's not perfect, so let's talk about this for a minute. So as you can see, this right here is a perfect cut with that thing here. Now, I'm gonna be honest though, sometimes I effed up and if my motion of cutting is not super fluid and the wire is in place for just a second, you have these little valleys in the foam and you don't want them. Now, as you can see, the cut otherwise is pretty nice. Uh, this right here is the border just from the factory production. So that has a few holes in there, but what you're gonna do? At the end, we're gonna paint that and I hope you will see less of that. Now, you can see it right here too. Yeah, that's another really nice cut where... <clears throat> yeah, then why I got a little bit hot there. Now, one question that I will see already in the comment section is gonna be, well, can I not use an X-Acto knife for that? And to be honest, you can probably, but first of all, the moment you do not have a super sharp blade and you cut a lot of foam, so keep that in mind, then the foam will crumble and you will see that. And the second thing is, with the thermal cut, if it's guided, you can have some really nice, perfect 90 degree angles here. If you do it with the knife, the knife very quickly starts to bend and you have like cuts like this or cuts like that. I'm exaggerating now, of course. And that might be an issue later on. If you have a cut like this, then suddenly you have a gap on top. If you have a cut like this, then suddenly the pieces won't fit anymore. It's not great. So for today, I will sandpaper a few edges because at a few places I'm not super happy and it's actually going over the wooden board and we don't want it, obviously. Then we're gonna work with the sculptor mold put that on here, wait for that to dry, paint it, and then hopefully I can put the green flock on top. So far I invested three hours and 26 minutes uh, because there's definitely one big lesson learned here that I will do differently next time. I will get smaller sheets of foam because it's really tough to work with this thing. This is an absolute must have in my opinion or something like that, but with the big sheets, it's, it's not working. Okay, and the moment you don't have some proper edges to work with and to guide with, it's gonna be a hassle and you don't want that. So, let's get to work. Let's jump to day two after the PVA glue dried. Molding, painting, flocking. I like this step. I want to get all plates covered in modeling compound and paint it. I grab some water and mix it with the modeling compound. Personally, I want an oatmeal consistency. You can make it thicker or more fluid. Up to you. Just try different combinations. A little warning here. The less water you use, the faster this paste will dry. And believe me, it dries fast. I apply my goo on like a third of the tile, form it and then put more compound paste on it. I never mixed more paste than needed for one module because it would dry out in my cup. This is a simple step, but you must be careful at the edges. This paste will get quite hard once it dried completely. Too much paste sticking over the edges will prevent your plates from aligning properly. So I use my hands to smoothen the edges and at the end I used one of the plates to press it against the borders. I used a plate that was sadly too damaged to be used anymore. So I use it as my control tool. So new day and new work session, we have everything ready now for some painting. Now painting the plates is important because at the end you will put flock on it and honestly the flock will probably not get you 100% coverage. If you want to get 100% coverage with the flock you will need a lot of it and that will be expensive. So having a layer of green underneath it and then putting the flock on it or brown if you want to have a different terrain, absolutely worth it. Now we have a lot of work that is simple to do. So how can we achieve this? Oh yeah, child labor. Ja, super. Ich schau, dann kannst du noch ruhig ein bisschen den Pinsel ein bisschen mehr ausstellen und dann top 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 Können wir dann auch ab und zu mal einen Misthaufen machen? <lacht> einen Misthaufen? 
Ja, den gibt es an Feldern oft. An Feldern gibt es den oft, äh, ja. Wir werden nicht nur grün dann da rein tun, sondern vielleicht auch ein bisschen braunes streuen. Ne? Aber auch etwas, so was ganz Kleines. Nee, Gibt's das machen wir nicht. Weißt du warum? Weil die Figuren drauf stehen müssen. Was? Kein Misthaufen? Kein Misthaufen. Oder kein Erdehaufen? Keine Mauswürfel? Nein, weil die Figuren müssen da drauf stehen. Das wären echt... Wir können das dann machen, wenn wir mal eine Taverne oder sowas bauen. Eine Taverne. Äh, eine Taverne ist ein Gasthaus und das ist aber ein Begriff aus dem Mittelalter. Und dann aber eine Taverne. Eine Taverne, da, da was ist damit? Da tun wir ähm, ähm, mit dem, wie heißt es nochmal, der da drüben im anderen Zimmer. Mit dem, ah, mit dem 3D-Drucker? Ja, mit dem. Mit dem wirst du was machen. Dann Schieß. Ski. Ski. Braune Schieß. Die, die sehe ich oft auf einer Almhütte. Aber, ach so, altes Ski. Ja, aber das ist doch Fantasy, Schatzi. Ja. Aber ich würde es gerne so machen. Oder mit der Leiter, die da so hängt. Eine Leiter kann man hinmachen. Weil ich sehe Weißt was? So wir, wir suchen die Teile für die Taverne einfach gemeinsam aus und du kannst dir da ein paar aussuchen. Mhm. Am Ende entscheiden auch ich, aber du darfst auch ein paar aussuchen. Abgemacht? And I just want to share a lesson learned with that. Uh, first of all, it's not going that much faster when you do it with your kids. And second, be careful what kind of green you take. So with that green, um, it worked, but the problem is that you will always see a little bit the edge of your modules because you can't really glue there because otherwise you have overlapping flock and then it will block your plates. Now, with that in mind, I realized, well, green is nice, but you need the right green. So you need to get a color that is very close to your flock mix. And with that, I went back to a hardware store and got some new paint. I actually got it custom mix. And I got myself a whole bucket, so I have the same tone already saved for future projects. And with that, I started painting. Super simple step, but to be honest, not very exciting. And now it's time to get some life on these plates. I put a layer of PVA glue on it and then sprinkled my green flock and brown flock, so whatever you want to use on top of it. Just make sure that at the borders you have nothing overlapping because otherwise your plates will not fit at the ends. A box underneath catches all the excess flock, otherwise your plates will look like a mess. All right, day four, let's do something a little bit more complex. Building river plates. Okay, before we cut anything, we need to mark the entry and exit points of our river. For that, I cut a little cardboard template. Mark the middle of the plate and draw your cutting line. This is needed because otherwise your river segments will not fit together neatly. Draw the entry and exit points on the smoothest borders. We will work with resin later and you don't want to have uneven surfaces when you work with epoxy. Now draw the outline for the riverbed. You can get creative here. Before you melt any foam, put on your respirator. I will probably mention this multiple times in the video, but I don't care. Your health is important and some people might skip certain chapters. I let the hot wire tool reach a nice heat and then started with the entry and exit points. I like this little hot wire rod for this. Gonna be honest with you though, for the rest of the piece I highly recommend getting or building a U-shaped hot wire tool. I then cut with my X-Acto knife the chunks out of the board. Sometimes this worked very well, especially at the borders. That was quite the pleasant surprise. It's a little bit more tricky with the rest. I always nudge the foam a bit to get a feeling for where more melting or cutting needs to be done. And then we get something like this. Don't worry if it's not super even, nobody will see this later. Save your time and let's move on. Now, rivers can have various effects while you play with them. You either make them terrain that can't be crossed or you decide units crossing the river lose a bit of their movement. We have our own house rules and decided that completely blocking the movement for units is a bit too crazy of an impact. But maybe this is exactly something you're looking for. However, you can't really play with zero crossing points for your army. A bridge would be nice, but a bridge costs also a lot of time. I will do a video about bridges, but not today. A nifty trick is a fort in the river. Just cut the middle segments less deep and give it later a different texture. Always use a marker before jumping to the cutting. Right here I decided to rearrange an island and even mix a fort into the plate. 
Now I did this with seven plates and went for multiple L-shaped rivers and some straight lines that have forts. Time to get the texture for the riverbed and river sides. I used some putty for this. The hardware store has plenty of that and it's cheap. Just make sure it's not reacting negatively with any fluids. A little spatula is all I need to spread the filler everywhere. The one that I'm using right here is actually pretty flexible and you can bend it a lot. That helps because sometimes in these river beds you don't have a lot of space to work with. It's okay to go a little bit thicker here, you will see in a second why. Just don't go absolutely crazy with it because otherwise it will crack once it dries. If that happens, no big deal, you can seal that again. Just a bit of extra work. Before you let the putty dry though, get some rocks. You can literally take rocks from outside. I got mine from a hobby shop where I live. The cool thing about this, the putty will hold most of the rocks in place without the need of any glue, once everything dried. Bigger rocks roll to the deepest part of the river, keep that in mind. Once I placed the big rocks, I added some gravel. I'll repeat this with all the other modules. Whenever I had a fort, I only put the gravel into the putty. No big rocks. You can, of course, use bigger rocks that will stick out of the water or put bigger rocks on the forts. Just keep in mind that everything spiky will make it difficult to place your minis. Once that is done, I mix some modeling compound again and repeat the steps from earlier. So far, nothing is involving any magic, does it now? Just be careful with nothing sticking over any border. That would be very unpleasant in a future step. Since the putty should still be moist, you can even wet blend the modeling compound with the filler to get a smoother transition. The modeling compound dries so incredibly fast, the moment you finish the last plate, you can already paint the first one. I took a little break now because I was already crafting for quite a while now. Next, I applied some isopropyl alcohol and then some thinned down PVA glue. The putty is not completely dry. If you're not in a hurry, you can do that the next day. But the putty is something that dries relatively fast too and only the areas where you applied really a lot of it, it won't be dry yet. Pushing the rocks and then the gravel into the putty and applying the sealing glue on top of it will secure most of the rocks. Since there is now a lot of watered down PVA glue, I go back and sprinkle more gravel into the glue pools. You can't really avoid that without spending too much time on this. The glue will run down from the riverside into the riverbed. The glue is not super runny, but I made sure to wipe away any excess glue that decided to go over the borders. So don't do this before going to bed. Every couple minutes, a quick check for, I would say, half an hour was enough for me to call it quits for today. Now, day five, giving a river life. Next day, nice, I mixed a custom color for the river. Honestly, take whatever you like. Maybe you are on an alien planet, go crazy. Uh, I go boring, kind of regretting that now. This step is also very simple. There are one or two tricks though you can do here. For example, once the first color is dry, I make a darker and darker mix and paint less and less of the riverbed. At the end, I have the darkest area painted in the deepest river parts. This helps with the simulation of depth. Wait until everything is dry, then cover all the spots that are still white and there will be quite a lot. Next, we paint rocks. I like them in a reddish brown. I took Mornfang brown for the big rocks. You don't have to do this, but you will see quite a difference later. At the same time, I filled the cracks with dry bark. It's nice because the dark spots gave the riverbed a bit of a more textured look. Next up, dry brushing. I took Stonewall Grey, but honestly, any stone color works for this. Just make sure not to have too much paint on your brush, otherwise, great. When that happens, just repeat the paint steps from earlier, no biggie. You learned your lesson now, at least I hope. To make the rocks pop even more, I dry brush with pure white. Not everywhere, I try to hit only the raised edges. It might not look like much while watching me do it, but a side-by-side -side comparison shows how much just a few extra minutes of dry brushing are helping to sell the piece. Let's get dirty now. I use some pure PVA glue and apply it on the riverside. I didn't water it down because otherwise it would all run into the riverbed. 
I hold the module at an angle and then sprinkle dirt out of my garden on the glue. Yeah, regular earth. Doesn't get cheaper than that. I catch the excess material and reuse it. Just be careful to not glue too many bucks onto your plate. Because A, we are not playing Helldivers 2 right now, so poor bucks. And B, well, that should be reason enough. Also let the earth sit a little bit at room temperature to dry it. Working with wet earth is not very recommended. Once that's done, I used pure PVA glue and applied green flock. I tried watered down glue, but I wasn't super happy with the end result of that. The drying process kinda produced patches of green flock and not an even coat. I apply the green flock at the borders first and I make sure nothing is going over the border of the module. Yeah, I know. My second name is Broken Record. I let it dry for a few hours and hit it with a mix of isopropyl alcohol and watered down glue. I let that dry overnight and then we have something like this. Honestly, for using only simple methods, this looks like a charm. And now day 6. Hate-love relationship epoxy resin. Now comes probably the most annoying step, working with resin. I'm working with a little trick here. I use UV resin that you can hard super fast with a, you guessed it, UV torch. Now why am I doing this? Resin is not your friend. It lurks in the shadows, worshipping its own foul and cruel gods and is just waiting for the right moment to ruin your hard work. I take some masking tape and seal off the entry and exit points. Afterwards I use the UV resin and put it where the foam plate is touching the tape. You can of course use glue, I did it in the past, it was not that great. The UV resin will do the job way better, uh, hopefully. Always hold something against the tape though, because the UV resin, or the resin you are about to pour into the river, might bulge the tape. And once that happens, you have to invest some very annoying work hours to make the tines fit again. If you want to, decorate the pieces with plants. I use kelp, various river plants and different types of mushrooms. This will give your terrain life. I personally would never skip this step, but I'm not your mom, so you don't have to listen to me anyway. Before we mix the resin, take a ruler and draw a line to see how high the resin should be at the end. That way the water in the river will have the same height in all plates. Let's mix some epoxy. Honestly, read the instructions. Some resin is a two component mix, some resin can just be taken out of the bottle. Right here I use a two component epoxy. The only thing important is that it hardens transparent. If you want to, you can mix it with a drop of brown, blue or green to give the water some color. Be careful though, you need just a super tiny amount of color to alter the color of the resin. Too much color and you won't see the bottom of your riverbed anymore. I decided to go with clear water and didn't add any color. Once I mixed and steered everything for 5 minutes, I pour everything in a different container and steer again for 5 minutes. Because that's what they wrote in the box. That should do it. It gets a bit messy now, so before working with this, don't forget to use a respirator, gloves and ideally some sort of safety glasses. You do not want a splash of resin hit your eyes. Source? Trust me bro. Now I mix 750ml of resin. I'm a bit scared to just pour it into the river, so I take a small cup and transfer it from the big bucket into the river. This is super exciting, satisfying, but also a scary moment. How will it look? Will the seal at the border hold? The moment of truth will be here soon. Now you will have some bubbles. Take a blowtorch and do some controlled bursts of heat to break the bubbles. For the first 30 minutes while everything dries, I babysit the drying process and get rid of the bubbles. Be careful not to burn anything. Especially the riverside has some dried organic matter. That stuff loves to go up in flames. Even though you coated it with scenic glue. Once I have less resin in the bucket, I just pour it directly out of the bucket. Be careful though. Don't do too much at once. The resin will flow from the higher levels to the lower levels. And that can take a few seconds. So if you fill enough resin immediately at the beginning to hit the green marker at the masking tape, and then the resin from the higher parts flows to the lower parts, 
yeah, the water surface will be too high. And then, at the end, I let this dry for 24 hours. A few hints before we jump to the next day. If you're worried that your resin will leak, put the plates on something elevated. That way they will not stuck to whatever is underneath them. Also get a big piece of cardboard or even better, a huge tray. Once you have that, put the river plates next to each other. Put something in between them to separate them. So worst case scenario and the resin starts leaking, the modules won't stick together. Additionally, it helps the masking tape to keep its form. Okay, we're almost done. Day 7, grand reveal and finishing touch. Alright, let's see how we did. I was pretty nervous while recording this and... Perfect! Like, quite literally. If you feel like it, you can tidy up the brown paint, but honestly, it's not a big deal. You won't see that anyway. The only thing I did here was tidying up the resin edges. The resin likes to creep up the masking tape. Use your hobby knife to get rid of that. We are almost done now. We have rivers and no river has a smooth surface. Let's get a water effect on it. Luckily you can just bite it in a bottle. I have this at home, bought that ages ago and it lasts forever as long as you're not doing any crazy projects. I use a brush to shape some waves. Waves go away from the riverside and away from the plants, keep that in mind. If you have rocks sticking out of the resin, you should do the effect over there too. This is something that I will try for future river segments. After the first layer dried, I decided to put a second one on top because I had the feeling a single layer didn't make great waves. Now my river is rather calm, if this would be a diorama, I would add some foam and current effects. But minis will literally stand in this river since our house rules allow us to cross shallow rivers. And that's probably not a good mix. Okay, and here we are dude, I'm super happy with how these tiles worked out. Um, I'm gonna probably add a little bit more vegetation, like a few more mushrooms. I have some printed upstairs, so I paint them and put them on there. And now I would say, we take a board and put all the pieces on it, have a look at how, you know, the whole thing looks like. And then, yeah, we're pretty close to the finish. Not bad, not bad. So a few things I still have to do. Uh, there's a little bit of paint missing here. I have to clear a little bit uh, the resin parts here, cut off a few edges, but otherwise, this is great. And with that, I have a basic gaming table and now we can expand this. Maybe do a few modules now with a tavern or some houses, maybe a ruin. I don't know, maybe we have like a battlefield tile where you have corpses, maybe where you have roads, maybe some bridges, so more uh, water segments because definitely need that. I have a few spare parts, so I even have one more water part and a crap ton of green ones. So I can expand this to like double the size. And you can have some amazing battles on that one. Maybe I'm gonna add like uh, some hills, forests. Let me know in the comment section what you would like to see. And I think we're gonna finish this one with a little bit of a close up. Time for the end result. I'm happy with it, especially when you compare it with my first attempt. With foliage and plants, I'd go a bit more crazy in a diorama case. I played on this table already, and even the few plants I added got in the way every now and then. But boy, was I happy to play on this bad boy. And yeah, I forgot to mention, I also want to tell you how much that whole thing costs. And of course, we're gonna do that right now. Now, I of course promised you at the beginning a breakdown of the total cost of this project. Keep in mind, it's gonna be estimates because sometimes I buy something in bulk and I don't need everything. So the plywood was 52 euros, being the most expensive thing. The XPS foam was 36 euros. Yes, this is less than I said at the beginning because I didn't need everything and I have now something stocked for later projects. The flock was four euros and I needed six in total. The paint was 17.5 euros. That is a paint that they had to custom mix for me. The modeling compound with 26 euros. The epoxy resin with 45 euros hurts like hell. And the putty and the glue, honestly, I think I needed like 10 bucks each. That makes a total of 220.5 euros, 7.35 euros per module. Now keep in mind that the resin increases the cost of this significantly. So the plain grass fields are of course dirt cheap compared to the river parts. And yes, 
It's way more expensive than a gaming mat that costs 60 to 80 bucks. I'm not gonna discuss the pros and cons again, because everybody has to decide it for themselves. For me, a customized wargaming table is worth it. And then I also promised you a budget version of this, and that means you have no plywood, which is of course a little bit risky. Take XPS foam that is less thick, that would cost you 25 euros. I also found flock that was similar, but not as good looking. That was cheaper, and you even got more for your buck. Paint is something that you can probably not change too much. Now I hear already people shake a rattle can. Your XPS foam might not like that. If you try to do it with a rattle can, please put some masking tape on the edges of the XPS foam. Modeling compound you can reduce a little bit. I found some products that only cost like 10 euros. The epoxy resin is something that I would not do a budget version because honestly cheap epoxy will be a nightmare for you. And the putty and the glue is already dirt cheap. Makes a total of 133.5 euros, so 4.45 euros per module. There you go. I think it's important to show a rough budget for this project, so people at home can get an idea how much this will cost. So what do we do now? So again, I said it, I want to have more variety on the gaming table. And you guys can now, over the next couple of weeks, drop in the comment section, what kind of terrain do you want to see? And then I picked, uh, you know, the most common ones. And then we're going to do a poll and then uh, I'm gonna build that. that. That's gonna be nice, I hope. I'm really curious what you guys wanna see. I might do a few things uh, regardless. I would like to build a rune and a bridge. That would be cool because sure, we have this right here where the units can cross, but a bridge is of course a little bit more epic. And with that, I think I'm done with this video, which is amazing. This took me a couple of weeks to produce. Um, total time spent is... Yeah, I would say five or six days full evenings. You, you can do that. I built that over a couple of weeks whenever I had time. And um, yeah, you just have to wait with a few things with the PVA glue to dry and with the resin to dry before you continue because otherwise it's gonna be a effing mess. And then you have to redo it again. All right, curious what you guys wanna see next. And with that, I'm gonna roll the outro. Hope you enjoyed today's episode, it took me way too long to release this, it was a huge project, totally underestimated it, and I think on stream I promised you that video already two weeks ago. But here we go, and I hope you will like it. As always, big shout out to my patrons, thank you very much for being awesome over there, you guys are simply the best. Thank you for watching, next we're gonna have painting, and we also have to finally start our army on parades 2024. i see you in the next one, until then, have a good day, and bye bye.